how to get out of neutral. Amen. When driving your car, as aforestated stated inside of these series, all cars have a minimum of four gears, which includes but are not limited to the following. There's park, there's reverse, there's neutral, but there is also drive. When the car is in park, it is unable to go forwards or backwards. It is stuck in the same place because it's already arrived at its destination. Park represents the spirit of complacency. Likewise, when the car is in reverse, it is only able to go backwards and reverse represents my past. At the same time, when the car is in neutral, it is able to go forwards or backwards, but it is only able to go forwards or backwards contingent upon an outside influence or an external force exerted upon the car. If you push the car forward when the car is in neutral, the car moves forward. If you push the car backwards when the car is in neutral, the car moves backwards. If the car is in neutral and the nose of the car is pointed upward on the incline, the car will roll backwards. If the car is in neutral and the nose of the car is pointed downward on an incline, then the car will go forwards. But the car does not move in neutral if it were not for an external force or an external influence exerted upon the car. Neutral represents the influence of other people. Last but not least, there is a gear called drive. Somebody shout, I'm driven. When the car is in drive, it is only able to move in one direction, and that direction is forward. When the car is in drive, it is only able to make forward progress, and drive, ladies and gentlemen, represents my future. I'm going to say that again. Park represents the spirit of complacency. Reverse represents my past. Neutral represents the influence of other people. And drive represents my future pertaining to my relationship with Jesus the Christ, Son of the living God. The question that all of us need to be asking on this morning is what gear am I in pertaining to my relationship with Jesus the Christ? All of us, regardless of our ethnic background, economical background, your race, your gender, your creed, or your color, are in one out of the four of these gears pertaining to your relationship with God. Either you are in part due to the fact that you are dealing with a spirit of complacency. You are stuck in the same place. The same place that you were in 2015 is the same place that you are in 2016 and you are stuck there by choice. You don't want to move forward. You don't want to move backwards. You are satisfied with where you are because you think that you have already arrived. Maybe because of your past victories. Maybe because of how God moved inside of your past. You don't want to move forward. You don't want to move backwards. You like like just the way it is because because you think that you have already arrived and because you are dealing with a spirit of complacency, your mindset is in part pertaining to your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you are not in park, many of us are in reverse because many of us are not stuck in our present, but many of us are stuck in our past. Tell the person beside you, I refuse to be stuck in my past. Why are we stuck in our pants? Many of us are stuck in our pants because of the positives of our pants, but many of us are stuck in the pants because of the negatives of our pants. Maybe you are not in park. Maybe you are not in reverse. Many of us are in a gear called drive. Everybody shout drive. When you are in drive, you are only able to move forward in your relationship with God. When you are in drive, your focus is not your present, your focus is not your past, but your focus is moving forward. And the kind of drive that God wants all of us to have is not necessarily drive for material possessions, even though there's nothing wrong with material possessions, but God wants us to be driven towards a closer relationship with Jesus the Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, the gear that I want to hang my hat on this afternoon is not park, it is not reverse, it is not neutral, or it is not park, reverse, or drive, but it is a gear called neutral. Everybody shout neutral. 
When you are in neutral, you are liable to move forward or backwards. But you only move forward or backwards in your relationship with God contingent upon the company that you keep or the external influence of the people around you. If the people around you are moving towards God, you move towards God. If the people around you are not moving towards God, you are not moving towards God. You know what is right, but you don't have the power to make up your own mind. In spite of you being saved, sanctified, and filled with the precious gift of the Holy Spirit, in spite of you being inside of the church for 25 years, many of us play follow the leader even in church because at least if I'm grown, I ought to be able to make up my own mind. God doesn't want me playing follow the leader. Somebody shout, I'm coming out of neutral. There are three examples that I want to lift for our hearing on today of people that I found inside of the Bible who happen to be in a gear called neutral. I want to talk about how they are in neutral and how they get out of neutral. The first person that we see in neutral is in John chapter number three. His name is Nicodemus. The second person that we see in neutral is in Galatians chapter number two. His name is Peter. The third person that we see in neutral is in Revelation chapter chapter number three it is the church of Laodicea and so therefore as a consequence in John chapter number three Nicodemus is in neutral in Galatians chapter number two Peter is in neutral but in Revelation chapter number three the whole church of Laodicea is in neutral somebody shout I'm coming out of neutral First thing that we learn about neutral pertaining to the mindset of Nicodemus is that a neutral mindset kept Nicodemus from publicly standing for Jesus. I'm going to say that again. It is a neutral mindset that kept Nicodemus from publicly standing for Jesus. Notice what happens in John chapter number 3. Jesus has just performed miracle after miracle after miracle due to the fact that the writings of John highlight the miracles of of Jesus the Christ, son of the living God. So after Jesus performs miracle after miracle, there are certain people who did not believe in Jesus aforetime who are now starting to believe in Jesus because of the signs and the wonders of Jesus. In other words, the only reason that Jesus performed miracle signs and wonders were not to flex his muscles, but the only reason that Jesus performed miracle signs and wonders were to identify who he is as the Christ. So Jesus Jesus has just been performing miracle after miracle and people are starting to flock to Jesus not because of his words but because of his works. I'm going to say that again. They are starting to flock to Jesus not because of his words but because of his works. And when we pick this scripture up in John chapter number 3, there is a man by the name of Nicodemus who happens to be a Pharisee who's flocking to Jesus but he's not flocking to Jesus in the daytime. The Bible specifically says that when he comes to Jesus, he comes to Jesus at night. I said a whole lot right there, but all of us must understand number one, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Somebody shout a Pharisee. He's a religious leader at this particular moment in time in this day. Not only is he a religious leader, but Pharisees believed in the oral tradition of the law. They also believed in the written tradition of the law. Pharisees, unlike Sadducees, believed in the resurrection of the body, while Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the body. So what that says to all of us is that there's a religious leader who supposedly knows everything about the law but in spite of him supposedly know everything about the law he still has to come to Jesus but when he comes to Jesus he does not come to Jesus in the daytime he only comes to Jesus at nighttime he comes to Jesus when it's dark outside he comes to Jesus when nobody else is able to see him and the question has to be raised why is it that Nicodemus comes to Jesus when it's dark outside why is it that Nicodemus comes to Jesus when it's nighttime he comes to Jesus when it's dark outside he comes to Jesus at nighttime when nobody else can see him because Pharisees did not get along with Jesus and Jesus did not get along with the Pharisees in other words the Pharisees had this little clique, they had this little group, and notice that anytime Jesus spoke harshly to somebody, he never spoke harshly to new converts and new believers. But anytime Jesus rebuked somebody and spoke harshly to that 
particular individual, he only rebuked people and spoke harshly to the ones who happened to be the religious leaders of that day in that particular moment in time. So watch this, because Jesus does not get along with the Pharisees, and the Pharisees did not get along with Jesus. Pharisees did not like Jesus. Somebody shout, they didn't like Jesus. Now, Jesus did not have a problem with the Pharisees, but every time they did wrong, he did not let it slide. He called them out for their wrong. This is the same Jesus who called them vipers. It's the same Jesus who called them snakes. It's the same Jesus who called them hypocrites. He's not calling the people hypocrites who are in the pews trying to get to know God and seeking God with everything that they have. He's calling the people hypocrites who happen to be in the pulpit. He's not calling the people hypocrites who come to church and who got an issue. He's calling the people hypocrites who come to church and act like they don't have of an issue somebody just missed it I'm going to say it again a hypocrite is not somebody who comes to church with an issue a hypocrite is somebody who comes to church acting like they got it all together it's somebody who comes to church acting like they do not have an issue so Jesus did not let them skate by freely but every time they messed up Jesus called them out so Pharisees did not like Jesus. So the reason that Nicodemus comes to Jesus at nighttime, somebody shout at nighttime. He does not want to be frowned upon by the other Pharisees or his other partners because he knows that if they find out that he's coming to Jesus, they're going to frown on him. And so therefore, as a consequence, even though he knows that Jesus comes, to, comes from God, notice what he says about Jesus. He says, Master, he says, nobody can deny that you are a rabbi and you come from God. Nobody can deny that you come from God. We might not like you, but we cannot deny you because nobody can do the miracles that you do except they come from God. Nobody can do the works that you do except that they come from God. In other words, I can't stand you, but I cannot deny the hand of God is on your life. And when God's hand is on you, there are people around you who don't like you. There are people around you who can't stand you. But even though they don't like you and they can't stand you, they cannot deny that God's hand is on you. Does anybody believe that this afternoon? He comes to Jesus. He says, listen up, teacher. He says, you have got to be from God. Nobody can deny that you come from God because of the works that you do, because of the miracles, because of the signs, and because of the wonders that you do. So watch this. Even though my Pharisee partners don't like you, I'm going to tell you privately what I cannot tell you publicly. I can't say this to you publicly because I'm not under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I'm under the external influence of my Pharisee partners. And because I'm driven by the external influence of my Pharisee partners, I cannot stay, take a stand for you publicly, but I'll do it in private. Now, many of us point the finger at Nicodemus, but how many closet Christians do we have in 2016 who stand for Jesus in private when nobody else is looking, but in the public, you deny him all day long? You don't want nobody to know you saved. You don't want nobody to know you go to church. You don't want nobody to know that you sanctified and filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit. You don't want anybody to know that you serve God. But notice what God says. If you deny me before men, I'm going to deny you before my Father who's in heaven. Somebody shout, come out of the closet. It is only a neutral mindset that kept Nicodemus from publicly standing for Jesus. When you're neutral, you can't pick a side. When you're neutral, you are lukewarm. And if you pick a side, it's not because you made up your mind, somebody else made up your mind for you. So if you move towards God, somebody pushed you towards God. If you move away from God, somebody pushed you away from God. And Nicodemus is a religious leader, but in spite of him being in leadership, he's in neutral. Which says that you can have power in the church, you can have position in the church, but in spite of all of that power and all of that position, don't get it twisted, you can still be in neutral at the same time.
So the question has to be raised, how does he come out of neutral? He comes out of neutral because watch this, Nicodemus moved from neutral to a gear called drive only when Jesus confronted him. Somebody shout confrontation. Nicodemus does not come to Jesus and ask him a question, but notice Jesus gives him an answer even though Nicodemus never asked him a question. Can I paraphrase what Jesus is saying? He says, don't come to me with all that sweet talk trying to butter me up. He says, aside from all of that talk, I want you to know that except you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. In other words, you can talk about all these miracles, but buttering you up is not going to get you into the kingdom. Telling me how good I am is not going to get you into the kingdom. Watch this. Nicodemus is a foe of Jesus, but he moves to being a fan of Jesus. But God doesn't want us to stop at being a fan of Jesus because just because you're a fan of Jesus doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? So at this particular moment in time, he's a fan when he used to be a foe. In other words, I'm going to come to you privately and tell you how good you are. But in the public, I'm not going to be able to say it. Jesus cuts it all out. He says, except you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Then watch this. Not only does he say you can't enter into the kingdom of God, but after Jesus confronts him in John chapter number three, Nicodemus finally moves from just being a fan to a follower of Jesus in John chapter number seven. Because the same Nicodemus whom Jesus confronted in John chapter number three is the same Nicodemus who finally finally publicly stands for Jesus in John chapter number 7. In John chapter number 7, watch this, Jesus has pissed off the religious leaders. He pissed off the religious leaders because of his miracles, signs, and wonders. The religious leaders are losing control at this particular moment in time. People are not following them. People are now following Jesus. And because they're losing control, they are mad as hell at Jesus. They're mad at Jesus, so watch this. When they try to take him to trial and when they try to crucify him and lay hands on him, in John chapter number 7, verses 50 through 51, out of all of the people who can stand for Jesus publicly is Nicodemus. In John chapter number 3, he's in a gear called neutral. But in John chapter number 7, he's now in a gear called dry. How did he go from neutral to drive? He only goes from neutral to drive when he experiences confrontation. And many of us will never be able to move from neutral to drive because many of us don't want to be confronted. Many of us don't want to be told that we are wrong. Many of us don't want to be challenged. You think that everybody challenges you in trying to hate on you. Some people who challenge you ain't trying to hate on you. They're trying to get you to the place that God wants you to be. I already said it. If everybody around you is telling you what you want to hear, you need to find you a brand new circle of friends. I need some folk around me who are not going to sugarcoat the truth. I need some people around me who ain't just trying to tell me what I want to hear. I need some people around me who can tell me what thus saith the Lord, even when I don't feel like hearing it, at the expense of losing the friendship, knowing that I'd rather hurt you now that we might be able to be friends later. Why do you think the Bible declares faithful are the wounds of a friend? So number one, Nicodemus is in neutral, but the only way he goes from neutral to drive is when he experiences confrontation. Which means that the only way I'm able to go from neutral to drive is when I experience confrontation. Somebody shout, put it in drive. If you want to put it in drive, what you were really asking is, Lord, send me somebody in my life who ain't afraid of me. Send me somebody in my life who's not a fan of me. Send me somebody in my life who's not going to puff me up and tell me all the wonderful stuff about me without challenging me. You got to get ready because iron sharpens iron. You can't move from neutral to drive if God don't send that kind of person inside of your life. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? Second person who's in neutral inside of the scripture is not just Nicodemus. There is a man by the name of Peter. Everybody say Peter. Peter. A neutral mindset kept Peter from publicly standing for Jesus. 
The same way that a neutral mindset kept Nicodemus from publicly standing for Jesus, a neutral mindset kept Peter from publicly standing for Jesus. We know this to be true because when it is that we survey the book of Galatians, Paul, the apostle of Jesus the Christ, son of the living God, is writing to the church of Galatia. Somebody shout, he's writing to Galatia. And he's writing for the specific purpose of telling those who have been set free by the grace of God, I don't just want you to be set free, I want you to stay free. So he says in Galatians 5 verse number 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. In other words, because you have been set free by the grace of God, do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And the yoke of bondage that Paul is talking about is not just the old life of sin, but the yoke of bondage that Paul is talking about is the old life of the law. Somebody shout the law. In other words, what Paul is saying is that if you're going to be saved, you are saved by grace alone through faith. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is not the law of circumcision that saves you. It is the law of grace that saves you. Jews believe, watch this, or Judaizers believe that in order for somebody to be saved, it was both a combination of God's grace and a combination of man's works by being circumcised because the law said you had to be circumcised. But even though Peter was the apostle to the Jews, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and the headquarter of the Gentiles was at the church called Antioch. And Paul did not preach that you were saved by grace and human works of being circumcised of the law. But Paul says that you were saved only by the grace of God. And if you're never circumcised, you don't have to perform a ritualistic custom of being circumcised just to conform and fit in with Jewish people. But as long as you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, even if you're never circumcised, Paul says you are already saved. So once upon a time in Galatians chapter number two, as Paul is communicating this message to the church of Galatia, watch this, Paul is having a dinner or a lunch alongside Peter, alongside other Jews, alongside other Gentiles, and alongside other Judaizers, and alongside religious leaders of the church. The who's who of the religious community are at this lunch. I'm talking about the bishops are at this lunch. The apostle prelates are at this lunch. The presiding elders of district number one, Usher Bold Ministries Incorporated, are at this lunch. I'm talking about the whole who's who inside of the body of Christ is at this particular lunch and at this lunch Paul confronts Peter publicly. Why does he confront Peter publicly? Because Peter is acting hypocritical. As long as the Judaizers are nowhere to be found Peter does not mind having lunch with the Gentiles. But as soon as the Judaizers show up Peter distances himself from the Gentiles and says, I can't eat lunch with you. Watch this. Peter is a Jew. Gentiles are people who are not originally inside of the family of God. So as long as, watch this, the Judaizers are present, Peter says, I'm not having lunch with the Gentiles. Because the only way I'm going to have lunch with you when the Judaizers are present is not just if you believe in Christ, but if you were circumcised. But as soon as the Judaizers are not present, Peter says, now we can have lunch together now that the influencers are not around. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? So watch this. He would not publicly eat with the Gentiles only because of the influence of the Judaizers. It is the influence of the Judaizers that keeps Peter from fully accepting this message of grace. It is only the influence of other people that keeps Peter from accepting the truth. He does not accept the truth, not because he doesn't want to accept the truth, it's because he's influenced by somebody else. If you're going to be for me, at least be, uh, make up your own mind and be for me. If you're going to be against me, at least make up your own mind and be against me. But don't be ruled by the influence of other people with your grown self. You mean to tell me you that grown and you can't make up your own mind? We said to all of us, Peter is in neutral. Somebody shout he's in neutral. 
a neutral mindset kept Peter from publicly standing for Jesus. But how does he move from neutral to drive? I'm glad you asked. He goes from neutral to drive only when Paul confronts him. Somebody shout confrontation. Notice what Paul writes in Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 11. Paul says, I withstood him. I didn't write a letter to the council. I didn't ask for anybody else's permission. I didn't go tell everybody else I had a problem with Peter before I told Peter himself. He said, I didn't just withstand him. I did it face to face. Confrontation ought to be face to face. Why is it that everybody else knows you got a beef with somebody except for the person you got a beef with? Don't come sending me no anonymous notes. If you don't like what's going on here, at least put your name on it. Pastor Beavers, I disagree with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, anonymous. At least put your name on it. He says, I did it face to face. And because Peter had the courage to confront him face to face, watch this, or because Paul had the courage to confront Peter face to face, the same Peter who did not accept the message of grace in Galatians chapter number 2 is the same Peter who writes in 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 5, that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Does everybody hear what I'm saying? He only goes from neutral to drive when there's confrontation. Which means that if I want to get out of neutral and get in the gear called drive, moving towards the things of God, I cannot do it if God doesn't send somebody in my life to challenge me. I cannot do it if God doesn't send somebody in my life to confront me. Not everybody who challenges you and confronts you is hating on you, but God sends some people to challenge you and confront you because he really wants to see you do better and he really wants to see you go higher. Last group of people in neutral inside of the scripture, it is not just Nicodemus in neutral. It is not just Peter in neutral. Last but not least, it is a whole church of Laodicea in neutral. Somebody shout, Laodicea is in neutral. A neutral mindset keeps Laodicea from being on fire for Jesus. It is a neutral mindset that keeps Laodicea from taking a public Stand for Jesus. How do I know that they are neutral? When John the Revelator starts to rebuke the seven churches, when he gets to Laodicea, he says, I have seen your works. And after watching a full body of your works, I've noticed something and there's something that I really don't like. I've noticed that you are neither cold nor hot. He says, I would that you were cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm, neutral is so bad in the eyesight of God, he says, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. He says, I notice that you have not taken a side pertaining to your relationship with Jesus to Christ. One minute you in the church, the next minute you out of the church. And it's contingent upon your outside influence. When you hang around people who go to church, you act saved. When you hang around people who don't come to church, you act like you ain't saved. Matter of fact, you don't even want them to know that you were saved. Why is that? Because you are in a gear called neutral. He says, I wish you would either be cold or hot, but please don't stay in neutral. I wish you would be cold or hot, but please don't remain lukewarm. John the Revelator is literally using an analogy of the water supply in Laodicea. In Laodicea, they had a problem with their water supply. They had fresh, hot water springs that pumped water from Laodicea to their destination. But by the time that they got to the destination, the water was no longer hot or cold. It was lukewarm. So it started out hot, but the further it traveled, the temperature cooled off. That's many of us pertaining to our relationship with God. We start out on fire for Jesus. But the more and more we journey in our relationship with Jesus the Christ, some kind of way we cool off. What happened to your tribe? How did you start out on fire for Jesus 
and move from that place to a place of neutrality when you are lukewarm. A neutral mindset kept Laodicea from being on fire for Jesus. Laodicea was lukewarm according to Revelation chapter number 3 verses 15 through 16 not because of the influence of people but because of the influence of wealth. This city was known for their money. This city was known for having gold. This city was known for their doctors. Doctors made an expensive medical eye salve in order to help people to see a little bit better. This city was known for wool manufacturing. I'm talking about this city had it going on like popcorn, but, but it was their wealth that caused them to enter into a state of being neutral. So the question has to be raised, how did they get from neutral to drive? Anybody want to know? The same way that Nicodemus went from neutral to drive, the same way that Peter went from neutral to drive, is the same way that Laodicea went from neutral to drive. They had to be confronted. Somebody shout confrontation. Laodicea could not go from neutral to drive if John the Revelator did not confront them. Notice he writes, he says, you think that you are rich, and because you think that you are rich, you think that you have so much that you don't need God. So you're no longer dependent upon the source, you're dependent upon his resources. He says, but I want you to know why you think you got it going on, he said, you're really wretched. Yeah, that's what he says. <laughs> he says, you think you got it going on, but, but you're really miserable. You're really poor. You're really blind. You're really naked. You don't have it going on the way you think you got it going on. And every now and again, you need some real people in your circle who can give you a wake-up call and tell you you don't have it going on the way you think you got it going on. And after he tells them you don't have it going on the way you think you have it going on, he then says, I challenge you to repent. I challenge you to turn around. Perhaps there's somebody in here today. I'm right up your alley. You have yet to declare a public stand for Jesus. In private, you can live for him all day long. But in public, you won't even mention his name. It amazes me all the modern day Nicodemuses, literally, I'm talking about politicians. I'm talking about educators. I'm talking about Birmingham City Board of Education. <laughs> I'm calling every last one of them out. Who come to me in private. Y'all doing such a good work. <laughs> but because of my political stance, I can't endorse you publicly. But I just want you to know how much of a good job you're doing. Nicodemus. If you're not going to give me an endorsement, let it be because you chose not to. If you're going to endorse me, let it be because you chose to. But you mean to tell me you're 50 years old and you can't make up your own mind? Because you're afraid of what your political affiliations going to think about you? Somebody shout, it's time to get out of neutral. Put it in drive. Everybody stand to your feet.